Hi everybody, it's Dystopian Wars Week here at On Tabletop, and we have two amazing prizes up for grabs. Our first prize is the Sturgenium Skies two-player starter set. For your chance to win, get your comments in on YouTube. Our second prize is the Hunt for the Prometheus two-player starter set. The winner for this prize will be chosen from comments on OnTabletop.com. Hello everybody. We're back with another faction chat for Dystopian Wars. I'm joined by Chris, and this time we are going to be taking a look at The Crown. The Crown is uh, certainly was the most powerful mm -hmm. faction um, up until more or less present day or kind of around the, the time of the Ore War, which was a decade or so before mm -hmm. where we are at the moment in the Dystopian Age. The Crown is certainly losing its dominance okay. on the world stage, starting to become stagnant, um, set in its ways. There's an arrogance of the crown uh, where... Reluctance to change. Yeah, they don't... Why should they? Yeah. They've always been powerful. They've always been the same. Why should... Because these upstart factions, mm -hmm. you know, trying to carve their own power base in the world doesn't mean that the, the crown should panic about mm. anything. And so... They are steadily falling into decline and becoming a little bit um, overshadowed by some of these newcomers. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, there's a lot of grey on the map. Yes. So we have Great Britain, obviously, India, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, um, and a number of other smaller Hmm. Um, colonies that are part of the crown itself. Yeah, the sun never sets, as they say. That's right. On, on the empire, and in this case, that still maintains even in the dystopian wars. It, it does indeed. Hmm. So you've got all these these upstart factions that hmm. are now starting to 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 take little bites out of the crown's dominance, and therefore the crown is engaged on all fronts in these small saber rattling mm. skirmishes between the other factions, where they're they're trying to grab power, and the crown are trying to, at the moment, just really keep hold of what they have, yeah. um, and and stick to stick to their guns, and ride ride out this new wave of. Yeah. of uh, of new factions that are coming into the world. When you're looking at a lot of countries and nations that aren't even 100 years old at this stage, you know, but who do they think they are? Exactly. And when you do cover such a, a, a large geographic extent, you're always going to be running up against people. You were saying uh, that there's a lot going on in South America right now. And, and uh, you know, it's only a short step across the Straits to New Zealand and Australia at that point. So yep. constant, constant headbutting. Well, this Stiginium Skies um, campaign that's in the box um, details the Imperium trying to attack Canada okay. and take some of the uh, possessions of the Crown in that large landmass in the north there. So uh, that's a really good yeah. kind of conflict that the the forces of uh, the the British are, have mm -hmm. sent reinforcements over to Canada to help quell that mm. very much aerial-based uh, assault that's coming over from the Imperium. So yeah. that's a real real good example of one of these um, small conflicts yeah. that, that are Just kind of firing up. It's not enough to get both factions into a massive all-out conflict because that would then weaken both of them and allow one of the other factions to step in mm. while they're blindsided and take advantage of that conflict. So. You know, we've got this kind of stalemate that's going on where nobody really wants to take a step too far. Yeah, because at that point, then either the Commonwealth will sweep in uh, or the Union will come northwards exactly. and all of a sudden you've lost a big prime piece of real estate there. Um, so with the Crown, British line tactics have been famous for centuries of being very much uh, sort of based on the broadside. You go straight through the enemy's lines when they're lined up against you and you just rake on both both flanks. Does the Crown follow that style of gameplay or have they changed and expanded with the way the, the dystopian age has come around? They, they certainly can. Uh, there is a rule called crossing the T, which does exactly that, mm -hmm. where you you come alongside a ship and you, you rake it from the stern or, or, or prow. Right. Yeah. 
and uh, devastate it by just firing all of your weapons. And then allows the broadside to fire and add dice into the main gun batteries. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly a tactic that works very well with the Crown, especially with the British um, ships, because of the way their gun batteries are aligned. It means that in order to make the most of them, you you have to get side on yeah. and get that broadside fire. So that feel is definitely still a very British thing. Whereas the Canadians have got a, a slightly different layout and they have their guns fixed to the fore. Right. And therefore they, they work in a slightly different way, although um, uh, they are built uh, on similar lines. They also have this ablative armor at the front, which helps them, um, you know, yeah, well, kind when of when they're being a bit more gung ho. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. They can just fight, you know, they can just um, steam a full ahead straight at the enemy lines and take the damage while they're piling in okay. the, the shells. It's interesting. It's nice that the, um, the various sort of areas of the, the, uh, the crown don't all rigidly follow mm -hmm. the same style of, of fighting as well. Which, Absolutely, yeah. Which means we can uh, expect to see other things in the, the future as well with uh, a slightly more geographic tweak to it, I suppose. Yes, ab yeah, that, totally. Yeah. And that, that's the point. It's having a bit of a flavour within the different nations yeah. of each faction give players that flexibility to play something slightly different. So mm. You don't have to just stick to the British all the time. Yeah. You can still be a crown player, you can play Canadians in the future. It'll be the Raj hmm. um, and whatever else we can uh, we can bring out. Excellent stuff. Um, swapping over then to take a look at the the tactical side, the order of battle for the crown. Yeah. So, as you mentioned before, the order of battle is your um, is your handbook for the faction. Mm -hmm. It it tells you all the rules of the faction, how to build your battle fleets. We have for each faction a, a, a faction battle fleet, which is quite flexible mm -hmm. in what you can build into it, uh, but you don't get any bonuses right. for that. Whereas the more thematic fleets, and let's take the Victory, for example, which mm -hmm. is uh, one of my favourite ships in the Crown, uh, is very much about having uh, the Victory front and centre mm -hmm. and then having supporting units around it, which um, give a lot more SRS tokens. So it's very yeah. much a fighter, bomber, heavy um, fleet. And that's, um, you know, for people who want to play with SRS tokens and go, you know, double down on that particular mechanic, then that's, that's a great way to get into it. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because it really, I suppose it leans into that idea of the, um, the wings of fighters, the, the, massive carrier ships and in you know in the same way that um great britain itself was seen as, as sort of just a massive airstrip yeah um to approach and attack its enemies across the channel then likewise they they have very good fighter pilots and a, a very good navy so leaning into that is always good also my father served on board victorious which is a, an aircraft carrier so i'm 100 percent on board with this excellent you know? that's good yeah um, so what other things that can people expect to see within the, the order of battle for the Crown? The Protector, which is the Canadian uh, submarine carrier, which is an interesting yeah. crossover. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's just a really cool unit. I really like it. It looks really good. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lovely miniature. And it's got some surprising features. Obviously, it's submerged, yeah. um, and it can launch fighters. So that's that's a great yeah, thing, right? Yeah. yeah, they have very good um, defensive SRS tokens. Mm -hmm. So um, they're good at protecting your ships as well as being on the offensive. Mm. And the one thing uh, we have to really talk about is the Britannia when you're talking mm. about building a battle fleet, because it is the mainstay of battle fleets for the crown okay um it's a good all-rounder it's a solid dependable battleship and you can have some really um interesting varied um battle fleets built around the britannia yeah. so that's that's a, another good place to start for players who want to get into the crown get yourself a britannia fleet and then add some cruiser squadrons mm -hmm. onto that and just build on it from there. Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, weapon types then that the Crown favour over others? The Crown, the Crown have a very strong torpedo game. Yeah. So my tactic for playing the Crown is 
to try and go for the defences down critical hit. Okay, yeah. And then launching torpedoes at that stricken vessel. Yeah. And with no defences, those torpedoes can just go through armour like a knife through butter. And you can get some really nice takedowns Mm. with with that tactic. Um, You can also have torpedo turrets. So you can place a heavy turret with torpedo turrets. Most of the ships already have torpedoes anyway. So it means you get a lot of torpedo launches. So, you know, you have some cruisers with those torpedo turrets. You leave the activation till the last and then you target whatever you've taken the defences down on and you end their day in a very nasty way. Seems very harsh. also means then that the uh, the Crown are really leaning into the the operations and the SRS uh, yep. in a big way that um, can mess up your opponent's day, shall we say? You know? Totally. Uh, the other great thing I like about the Crown are the Guardian generators, <laughs> and it's a unique uh, ability for the Crown currently, at least, in that you have the Guardian generators within your entire force yep. add together to create a. Uh, uh, buffer yeah like a, a pool of mm. of defensive dice okay that you can allocate throughout the round uh to whatever attacks come in so you kind of got this bluff double bluff thing going on where your opponent knows you've got this massive pool of dice yeah so do they want to go for their heavy hits first or they do they want to do they want to kind of wear you down a bit yeah. before they go for the that alpha strike so Again, it's a very tactical thing where you're you're holding your cards close to your chest. Sure. You've got this pool, and how do you use it? Do you do you use that immediately? Mm. Do you hold some of it in reserve? And it adds another layer of of strategy to the crown play, which I really enjoy. Yeah, I suppose it's very different from ships that have very heavy armor or ablative armor, where it will just take off from mm. the hit that comes in. You're choosing when best to deploy the the resources of the Guardian Generator. That's right. And it means that if you've got a specific play that you want to go for, if you want some of your aerial units to take an objective, you can focus your your Guardian Generators on that unit to make sure that it gets where it needs to go. It might mean that some of your other units suffer as a result, but if that's the play you're going for, then it, it helps to fulfill that. Omelette and eggs, I think, is the expression on that one. Um, what are some of the, the standout ships then within these fleets that are the big capital ships that you sort of tend to go for? Or well, we've, we've mentioned the Britannia. Um, we've mentioned the Victory. We've mentioned the Protector, uh, something that will be coming out fairly soon as a, a miniature, but is already mm-hmm. in the Orbats, is the Gloriana. Like many of the, of the ships in the Crown, it's equipped with a prow ram. Mm. So... Uh, the Crown also are quite good at that aggressive up in your face. Send uh, in the Marines. Yeah, yeah. well, that, that as well. Mm. Um, they have some good rules about um, their crews as well. Yeah. So they're very good in assault. Even if the ship's crippled, their Marines are still fairly, um, uh, they still use the, the battle-ready mm. um, fray attribute. So... Um, they are good at taking damage, but still being able to to assault. And the Gloriana is just bristling with weapons. And uh, that's I'm really looking forward to that coming out. Does sound like it's going to be a, a mainstay of a lot of fleets, I think, in the future. Uh, so there we have it. If the Crown has piqued your interest, folks, there's the new Sturginium Skies. That's right, Sturginium Skies, which has a lot of Crown units yeah. in there, as you can see, so arrayed before us. If you fancy going for the Canadians and a bit more of a flying field, then that is doable as well. Uh, if you have any questions about the Crown, pop them below and we'll get you an answer. But until next time, bye bye. Hi, everybody, it's Dystopian Wars Week here at On Tabletop, and we have two amazing prizes up for grabs. Our first prize is the Sturginium Skies two player starter set. For your chance to win, get your comments in on YouTube. Our second prize is the Hunt for the Prometheus two-player starter set. The winner for this prize will be chosen from comments on ontabletop.com. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.